The power of your words today on Fixing the Money Thing. You are living in a day of extreme, intense spiritual deception and conflict. Spiritually, things are stirring. You know that. You have to speak to fear. When fear speaks, fear speaks. Is that not right? Thoughts, those thoughts speak to you consistently. And unless you speak back, you're gonna continually digging in a hole that you're hard to get out of. You need to speak back to fear louder than it's speaking to you with the truth of God's word. I'm Gary Cassie, and for nine years, we lived in a chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, I want my people free. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. You'll never find your destiny until you fix the money thing. So grab your Bibles, buckle your seatbelts. I hope someone would say it. You know, you can learn after a while what I'm gonna say. Buckle your seatbelts and we're gonna jump into the word. Today's title is Loose Lips Sink Ships. And of course that phrase has been around a long time. It's from World War II. I'll talk more about that here in just a minute, but it's gonna be a message that you'll wanna take notes on for sure. You are living in a day of extreme, intense spiritual deception and conflict. Spiritually, things are stirring, you know that. And so now is not the time to be asleep spiritually. I'll tell you right now. You don't want to be asleep. You need to hear the Holy Spirit on a daily basis and let him move you, warn you, lead you. But you need to walk by the Spirit in this day and hour. Now, a scripture that we've pointed out many times in the past is 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to look at this with you real quick. It says, uh, verse 8, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, say my enemy. enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now you have, a, you have an enemy. You need to understand you are in spiritual warfare. You may not acknowledge it. You may not say yes, but I'm telling you, you are in warfare. And your survival in this warfare depends on your knowledge of how to handle it. So let's take a look at this scripture a little closer. The definition of sober means to be circumspect, which that word means careful to consider all circumstances and possible consequences to be prudent, to to be watching. And so you need to be aware of what's happening around you, right? Uh, let's Let's be honest. If there really was a lion outside your door that was trying to get your family, how would that change your actions? You would definitely take some defensive actions there and some offensive actions. You'd lock your doors. You'd probably carry a sidearm. You'd probably, you know, watch that lion and learn his patterns and tell the kids to stay out. And it would change how you live. Is that right? Well, knowing you have an enemy should change how you live as well, because you have an enemy who is not just a costume, red costume with a pitchfork. Your enemy wants to take you out, out. And so you need to be aware of that. Now, what are we alert for? The Bible says to be alert and sober. So what are we alert for? We are alert for deception and fear. Now, here's the problem with deception. You know what I'm going to say next. People that are deceived don't know they're deceived. What is the only antidote for deception? Truth. But people that are deceived think they have the truth. So you have to have an absolute. And the absolute is the word of God. And it is the truth that you judge truth by, not feelings, nothing else. The word of God has to be your compass in this day and hour of what is truth, able to recognize deception. Let me, let me make this um, one comment. You need to take a note of this. If there is fear, I said, be on alert for fear and deception. Fear is an indicator of deception. Fear is not of God, Right. Every promise is yes and amen. So 
Fear, if there's fear in your life, it is an indicator that you're already deceived. You're already believing something that's not true, correct? So in fear shows its head in your life, you need to attack it with truth. And so you need to be on the alert. If fear pops up in your life, you need to realize, wait a minute, there's, I don't have faith, I have fear. What does God say about that situation? You need to back up and capture that moment and you need to deal with fear before it deals with you, right? Come on now. That's right. You know, you have to speak to fear. When fear speaks, fear speaks, is that not right? Thoughts, those thoughts speak to you consistently. And unless you speak back, you're gonna continually digging in a hole that you, you're hard to get out of. You need to speak back to fear louder than it's speaking to you with the truth of God's word. I know as a young pastor, you know, I was facing some issues and of course I think we all face issues, but uh, I was praying and nothing was happening. And so I was praying to God, why aren't these things happening? Why aren't these things fixing? You know, why are these things still hanging around? And he gave me a dream and I saw a closet and uh, this closet was a, a closet of shelving. Everything in the closet was in the floor, a big pile of books and things. The shelves were empty. And in the dream, I heard the voice of the Lord say, speak to it. And so I said in my dream, I said, in the name of Jesus, go back where you're supposed to be. And everything on the floor went whoosh, on the shelves, perfect, in order and neat and peace. Peace. I like that. And what was God trying to show me? Gary, you've got to take authority here. You've got to speak to this situation. And until you do, it's not going to change. He was teaching me how the kingdom operates. Listen, Jesus never prayed to God to fix a problem. It is not in the Bible you'll ever see Jesus pray to God to cast a demon out, pray to the Father to heal someone. Jesus always operated in authority and spoke to the situation. He's our role model. This is how it works. Matthew 17, 14 is a, is a story we read many times. But basically it says in verse 14, when they came to a crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire, into the water and the fire. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Jesus said, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. You see, Jesus knew who he was. He understood the authority he had. He understood how to release that authority and how to handle the situation. Unfortunately, so many believers do not know how to handle it. When things don't align right, you know, the Bible says this and they're seeing this, people make a decision to change their doctrine instead of asking God what went wrong, right? Listen, God's word never changes. If something is changing, it's not God's word. You can always know it's on your end. It's someplace you've missed it. It's someplace that short-circuited the kingdom of God. And your knowledge of how the kingdom operates is so important in warfare. Acts 19, verse 13. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus, <laughs> whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Now, Paul was casting demons out and healing people in this town. And they were seeing that and were pressed by the power of God being demonstrated. They said, well, I'll try that. And so they said, in the name of Jesus, you know, that Paul deals, you know, Paul's using. Uh, the Jesus, yeah. Uh, and so verse 15, one day the evil spirit answered them. Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now here's what I want to ask you. Who are you? Let me ask you, how well known is your name in hell? Hmm? They don't want to mess with Paul's house. They know about Paul. They know about Paul. 
They know Jesus. But who are you? What's your answer going to be? See, if you don't know who you are in Christ, you don't know your legal rights, who you are, the authority you stand in, what truth is, you won't have the right answer. You have to understand that. How well is your name known in hell? Well, let me go back uh, to Romans 10.10 for a moment. Romans 10.10 says you believe in your heart and you are justified, meaning that you believe, you're in faith. It's legal for heaven to invade your life, but that sentence goes on and says, then you do what? Then you confess unto salvation. Then you release that anointing. See, I had the anointing all over me, but I hadn't released it yet. I have the jurisdiction over my life. God was trying to show me, Gary, you've got to agree with heaven that this is a finished work. You've got to come into agreement. You know that I heal, but you've got to come into agreement that you are healed based on Mark eleven twenty four. So when I said there at, at the Peoria, at that root beer stand, when I said, when I said I am healed, bam, that's when the power of God was released in my life to bring the healing that took place. See, most Christians wait on God. They're waiting for God to do something. And what I wanna help you understand today is you have your part to play in this thing, how it operates.